when your tank gets stuck and you need to call AAA. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with another model showcase video for this 135th scale US M88A1 armored recovery vehicle. The model that you see here is built for my own personal collection and it's not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale to 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model here is built predominantly out of the box. However, I did have to go ahead and leave the confines of the kit in order to fully complete it to the condition that we have here. As for what these new components are and why I had to go ahead and do that, well, I'm gonna be going over all that information in this video. In addition to that, this model here is a complex one, so we're gonna be giving the model a thorough in-box review, and I'm also going to be taking you, the viewer, along and discussing all the aspects of this kit. This would include the numerous functional features that it has, as well as other areas of the build that you really need to pay attention to in order to avoid any mishaps. So stay tuned because there's going to be a ton of info and content coming right at you. So let's go ahead and kick this one off. And to start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the M88A1 Armored Recovery Vehicle. Some would refer to this vehicle as the Hercules, however, from what I've seen, that name was given to this vehicle when it reached the A2 designation. This being the earlier model, I'm not really sure if the name would apply, but feel free to put that in the comment section below. The M88 family is one of the largest tracked vehicles that are used by the US military. In fact, it's also one of the oldest tracked vehicles that are still in active service with the U.S. military. Aside from the U.S. military usage, this vehicle has been widely exported throughout many NATO countries where it still sees service to this very day. This vehicle here was first adopted by the U.S. military in 1961. The vehicle itself was in development throughout the years that proceeded in the 1950s, and the vehicle entered into full production once it was finally adopted by the U.S. military. The vehicle is an armored recovery vehicle. This is the type of thing that you call when your tank breaks down and you need to get it towed. The M88 is probably the world gold standard on an armored recovery vehicle and it's probably one of the best tools for the job that's currently in service today and or has really more or less ever been designed. There's a reason why this vehicle has stuck around for as long as it has. The M88 was to phase out its predecessor, which was the M74. The M74 was an armored recovery vehicle that does the same exact job as the M88. However, that vehicle was based on the M4A3 E8 Sherman. That vehicle was designed in the early 1950s. However, towards the end of the 50s and into the 60s, the M74 was definitely going to start showing its age. By this era, the U.S. military was using the M48 Patton as its mainstay vehicle, and you also had the M60 that was about to come onto the setting. At this point, both of these vehicles were really going to push the M74 to its limits to the point where it really wasn't going to be well suited for the task at hand. And this is why it was decided to create a brand new vehicle that was going to be able to lug around both the M48 and the M60. Just like with the M74, where they borrowed a extensive amount of the components and the hull fittings from the M4A3 Sherman. For the M88, they were going to do the exact same thing, but it was going to be taken from the M48 Patton. What is interesting, though, is that although the vehicle utilizes a lot from the M48, namely the suspension, the swing arms, the row wheels, the track, and the sprocket, and all that good stuff, it still utilized a lower hull that was more or less akin to the M47 design as opposed to the 48. The M48 is known to have that bathtub all cast hull, while the M88 has an angular plate hull assembly, much along the lines of the predecessor vehicles that I just mentioned. The vehicle originally weighed in at 50 tons, which was something that you were going to need in order to deal with the weight of the main battle tanks that were being used by the military at that time. Later, when the A2 designation came out, the vehicle gained 10 more tons in weight, again, in order to better suit the weight requirements in order to work with a vehicle like the M1. Along with borrowing many of the other suspension and running gear components from the M48 and M60, the vehicle also 
borrowed the engine, which is the Continental AV1790 V12 diesel engine. This is an excellent engine, it has a lot of reliability to it, and definitely was suitable for the task at hand. Some of the vehicle's most important and iconic features would include its main hoist boom. The boom itself is made to retract, so it's out of the way when in the storage mode. However, it can be deployed instantaneously, and now you have at your disposal a very heavy, high-capacity hoist for lifting heavy objects. On the front of the vehicle, there is also a very powerful winch, which is definitely important if you need to flip over and overturned vehicle or if you also need to pull something out of a ditch. In addition to that, the vehicle has a bulldozer blade on it which further enhances the the capabilities of this vehicle and in many times the bulldozer blade is used to anchor the M88 in place when using either the winch and or the hoist depending on the job at hand. Outside of the hoist and winch equipment, the remainder of the vehicle is purely dedicated to keep the other vehicles in operation. It's nothing more than a service truck, albeit a very cool service truck and probably the coolest service truck ever designed, but it's still a service truck nonetheless. Because of that, you will have all the amenities that you see on any service truck that you'll see at any construction site. This would include the provisions for oxyacetylene torch and cutting. You have the spare components for the various other vehicles strapped to the side, be it sprockets, track links, road wheels, what have you. And you even have probably the most convenient and coolest bit of equipment on the back, a nice convenient heavy duty vice, which is something that you definitely need to have in order to just work on several of the components found on these vehicles that tend to break down. The vehicle's crew was fully encased and protected by the armor protection, and the armor protection was going to be important because this vehicle was meant to operate in conditions where you're able to service and remove potentially knocked out vehicles or disabled vehicles off the road while under the threat of enemy fire. For armament, there's nothing really too much here. The vehicle's not really meant to be a combat vehicle, and on the commander's cupola ring, there is a fully revolving 50 caliber M2HB. The cupola is very interesting because the design itself is actually from the panoramic cupolas found on the Sherman tanks from World War II, but with the added addition of a ball bearing ring in order to mount the M2. With this ring, the entire hatch itself can rotate 360 degrees. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the project. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 135th scale M88A1 recovery vehicle from AFE Club. This is one kit that I've been wanting to get for a very long time and for good reason. The AFV Club M88A1 is an excellent kit and honestly, it is one of the most important kits that was ever released by AFV Club. This kit here dates back to the mid-1990s to, I want to say, 1994 or so, and at the time, AFV Club tooled this kit. When they tooled this kit up, AFV Club was not the company that we know it as today. They were a basically fresh upstart, and at the time, were releasing some very interesting tank kits from vehicle subjects that were basically being ignored by the other manufacturers of the time. Keep in mind, this is the dark age of the 90s, of course. Well, AFV Club at the time were doing mostly modern era vehicles. It wouldn't be until later on in the 2000s when they would start shifting into World War II subjects. So at this time, you would see kits among the Cold War era. Some of the other ones at this time would have been the M48H as well as also the Chaparral. The vintage CM11 kit from AFV Club was actually a subject matter of an older model showcase video that I did a number of years ago. In that video, I do a inbox review where I show that that kit is really an amalgamation of components from Academy as well as also some other components from AFV Club that they went ahead to fill in the difference to flesh out the model. This was basically the same type of format that Dragon was doing at the same time, only their kits of course were from Italy. Well, unlike the CM11, the M88A1 here was utilizing all 100% AFV Club tooling and it borrows no other tooling from any of the other kits that were on the market at the time. 
This kit here has been in production from AFV Club basically ever since because it is still to this day equally as relevant now as it was in the 90s when it first came out. And by the way, this isn't hyperbole or anything, but literally since the 1990s time frame, if you're looking for any 135th scale M88 recovery vehicle kit, this is going to be your exclusive option. And this is something that is a rarity in the armor modeling racket, specifically even today. I mean, how many times have we seen kits on this channel where I talk about this was the first one on the market and it's been so for the longest period of time until recently and you know now there's a plethora of them. That's not the case for the M88. This is still the only game in town. There are, well, there's actually one other option of an M88, which is from Ravel Germany, which, oh, by the way, it's, yeah, it's this kit's tooling just in a rebox with the Ravel Germany box art. Outside of that, this is still the de facto M88 kit. And fortunately, there's nothing wrong with that because this kit here is excellent. Although the kit's tooling dates back to the mid 1990s, the quality of the kit components is excellent. And it, this kit here is another one of those vintage kits that really did age very well. And you'll see that once I crack the box open. Like I stated before, this model has been basically in constant production since the 1990s. So fortunately, if you're looking for one of these kits, they are fairly easily come by. However, I do want to give the caveat that if you're looking for an AFE Club kit, you might want to jump on one sooner than later because unfortunately I heard news that the owner and founder of AFE Club has passed away. So there may be some problems with the company moving forward in the future. Hopefully that's not the case because their kits are excellent and you know, it's the guy's legacy. The, these kits are gorgeous and I do want to see the company continue to thrive. Outside of that note, these kits generally are extremely easily come by. These are the type of things that you will find in some well-equipped hobby shops, but realistically, you tend to see these models in places like swap meets or on, or more realistically, you're gonna find them on an online retailer. Some place like an online hobby shop or a place like Amazon or eBay. When found, they are fairly affordable. They retail anywhere between 40 to about 60 US dollars, anywhere in between, and Again, tracking one down shouldn't be too difficult at the time of filming this video. This particular model here I picked up off of eBay, I want to say maybe a year, maybe a year and a half ago, so it hasn't been sitting in the stash for very long. Only a mild little peach fuzz amount of dust on the cover here. As for the kit, this was something, again, I've always wanted to pick up. Now, AFV Club has released or re-released this model in a few different formats. The original kit release was this exact same kit here, only the box art was slightly different. The original Gen 1 kits for the M88 featured the exact same box art with the tricolor NATO camoed M88, but we didn't have this background silhouette that we have here, which I'll go over when I go over the graphic design. The second iteration of this kit was in the late 1990s. They took this kit and they retooled it, giving it for a backdated type pattern, and this was known as the Vietnam version of the M88A1. The Vietnam one features a few extra runners and also a few different components on it, which by the way, I actually built one in my youth and I have it in my collection. That one's probably gonna be the subject matter of an OTR video, so you want, might wanna stay tuned for that. But as for the kit here, after the Vietnam version, this kit was still in production, and then eventually the last iteration of the M88 kit that they released was one that was specifically geared for the Bundeswehr. And that one, again, it's this kit, but with a few other Bundeswehr flavor of components that are supplied with it. As I touched upon before, this kit was reboxed in the 1990s, or I should say the early 2000s period by Ravel Germany, where again, it's just this kit, but in a different box art. Only that one, I believe, also comes with a different set of decals to make it a Bundeswehr version of the M88. One other thing I wanna mention is that Currently, there are no M88A2 kits from AFV Club, nor are there any M88A2 kits on the market as far as I'm aware of. I may be mistaken with that, but right now, off the top of my head, I can't think of any A2 kits that are around. There were several conversion kits to convert this one here to the A2 variant, but that's really more or less out of the scope of this video. So. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and look at the model's box art and graphic design. As I touched upon before, this graphic over here for the AFV Club kit is the same one that has been utilized since the original release. The 
box art, or I should say the illustrator, is right over here. This individual has done many illustrations for AFV Club, and his artworks are always pretty good. As you can see, the vehicle is very well illustrated, has all the appropriate detailing found on the various surfaces. Everything is nicely rendered out, and again, it's an overall nice composition. The original Gen 1 release featured just a simple white background, like you know we see with Tamiya kits. However, in the mid-2000s, AFV Club shifted the format where they got rid of the white background, and they made the subject matter a little bit smaller on the illustration, but in the background gave a ghosted look where it's basically the same illustration blown up with a transparency added, as you can see here. This was something that I saw about, what, 2005, 2006 or so with the release of their M5A1 Stewart kit, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, the remainder of the graphic design is just fairly simple. He would have some typography going on with the name of the vehicle. Birch Panzer M8881. It's a recovery tank. And, of course, we have the big AFE Club logo right there in the lower right-hand portion. Of course, this is kit number AF35008. And that's all there is for the main cover. This one over here is unique because it has an extra sticker on it where apparently this one has markings to build this vehicle for a vehicle that is in the Taiwanese military. Unfortunately for this build over here, that's not going to be utilized because I'm making this one good old-fashioned US of A. From the main box art, takes to the side tab. Nothing really much going on here. It's quite standard. We have a thumbnail version of the same illustration on the front with the same verbiage in the same typeface, no less. It's the exact same thing on the opposite side, so nothing much to talk about over there. On the long tabs, we have some more verbiage, and we have some photographs here of a built example of this kit. On the reverse side, we have a Tamiya-esque panel illustration that has different profiles of this vehicle. And I believe that this kit does come with the option to build it in this variant much along the lines like what we see with Tamiya kits, where we have two options of markings. You can build like the one here on the box art, or you could do this at the time Desert Storm version of the M88. Of course, this is a polystyrene kit. More obviously on that, you'll see when I crack the box open, which is a perfect time to do so. Okay, one other thing I do want to mention about this kit, and this is a thing found on AFV Club kits, and it's one thing that I always kind of dug. Not only do you have a pretty cool box art, on the outside, but this is some really good showmanship. Much along the lines of some of the really old Tamiya kits back in the day, we have some more advertisements found on the inner portion here of the box, and this is just so AFV Club. So here we have some, and by the way, these sets here are, some of them I don't even think are still in production. They're kind of a product of their era. We have here a anti-tank set, which comes with the M40 recoilless and the tow missile. Which, by the way, I've actually built an example of this M40 on the AFV Club M38A1 Jeep with the recoilless. So that's another model showcase video that's found on the channel. Here we have some type of shells. I don't want to bump it to the camera. It's kind of hard to get it in focus. But we have a bunch of ammunition storage tubes for tanks. Obviously great for dioramas. And we have here some other really cool kits. We have the Striker, which was a kit that came out in the mid-2000s, and there was a little bit of an arms race going on between different companies and who can make the best Striker. AFV Club is definitely one of them. We have a really cool version of the M548 cargo vehicle, which is a M113 platform, but the Taiwanese are cool because they threw a Quad 50 on it because you throw a Quad 50 on anything, it makes it instantly cooler. We got a set of workable tracks for the Centurion. We have a whole set of working suspension for the Centurion. That's something interesting to point out for another video. Another really cool kit and possibly a future model showcase video, the U.S. Marine Corps LVT-85, which is definitely something I want to talk about in a later date. Nancy the Gun Truck, another really cool kit. Modern, or a modern era M35A2 Deuce. And another version of a Deuce. Of course, we also have the M102 Toad Howitzer. All of these are iconic AFV Club kits, and hopefully I'll be able to bring them all to you at one day in one flavor or another. So enough with that. Let's go ahead and get to the actual start of the show, which are the kit components themselves. So this kit here is all molded in this green-type plastic, and this is something that I've seen 
change on the various releases and incarnations of the AV Club kit. I'm not sure if this was the case on the original Gen 1 release, but I will say that the Vietnam version of this kit actually had the contents molded in a desert tan type coloring. As for the components themselves, they are all made from injection molded polystyrene. I don't believe there are any photo etch components applied with this kit, which is something that again was added and changed on the Vietnam variant release. I'm going to go ahead and open up the packaging here. So the upper and lower hulls are individually bagged, which is kind of cool. When you're opening it, by the way, you want to be careful when pulling it out because you could snag one of these sections over here and that could potentially break the thing, which is not beneficial to anybody. So keep that in mind. Okay, so here's the molding here of the upper hull. One thing I do want to point out that this is a very substantial size 135th scale model. I know that comes funny for me since I build 1.6 scale tanks, but that is, you know, you do realize how big something is, even 135, where when specifically it's the size, or I should say bigger than your hand. So the M8 is a large vehicle, and here you get to see the molded in quality of detailing. So the vehicle has some excellent details molded in. We have some well beads. We have the hinges on the door. We have the handle rendered out. We even have some cast numbers present right there on the lower portion. There is some cast texturing going on here. You could definitely see that replicated in some of the components. On the front area here, we got the periscopes integrally molded in. Not really any flash to mention. There is this large and runner section right here in the middle of the cupola, but this is something that's easily removed and it's something that is common on a lot of other kits out there, but it is something to mention nonetheless. You want to be careful when removing this because of the thicknesses and you don't want to mess with the cupola ring itself, but we're on that as the build goes on. We have here the one antenna base. It's found right there in the corner. The details on it are nicely rendered out. Here we have the grill work again, nicely rendered out very crisp details. And again, this is tooling here that dates back to the mid 1990s. So like I said before, this kit really did age very well, all things considered. On the side portions of the hull, you can see a bunch of little clamps. I believe these are fender mounting clamps and they are very nicely rendered out. They're very small, but yet are cleanly molded and are very crisp. And for the lower hull, it basically is nothing more than it's stretched out M47. And yes, the M88 is still part of the patent family and arguably it's the last M47 pattern of vehicle that's still in service with the US military. Some people will claim that it's more or less an M8 or I should say an M48, but with the shape of the hull here, this is more akin to an M47 as opposed to the M48's bathtub hull. With the lower hull removed from the bag, you get to see everything in better light. Note it has all of the access panels on the appropriate locations, and they even continued the well bead details on the lower extremities. With the suspension mounts, all the fasteners and access cap details are present, and again, everything is nicely rendered in place. With the side hull here, you get to see the bump stops, the channels for the shock absorbers, as well as the other details found on the final drive. Final drive is a little bit, I would presume to say, simplistic. However, keep in mind, this is gonna be covered up by the sprockets anyway, so the detailing here is sufficient for what it's being used for. On the rear area, we have some more details. It has the mud flaps integrally molded on, and these two sections here on the real vehicle, of course, would be rubber, but this is something that I'm gonna be touching upon after the model is completed, and I'm going over the finished paintwork but you still can see all the small little fasteners found on the leading edge over here, which separates the metal timbrick from the rubber flap. The plastic is pretty thick. It's a nice, durable, chunky bit of molding, which is actually something that is indicative of higher quality, and when the model's built, it has a nice, solid feel to it. Also found in the lower hull parts bag are the model's tracks, and this kit supplies you with a set of single-piece vinyl tracks. Which, by the way, was a bit of a surprise because on my last AFV Club M88 kit, those tracks were the workable track link type, and in fact, they are the AFV Club 
aftermarket workable track sets that they make for the M48 and the M60. And I figured that was true for all of the M88 kits. Well, apparently that's not the case because the standard M88 A1 kit gives you these in single piece vinyl. Which, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. These tracks are perfectly suffice for the build at hand, and I'm going to be rolling with these ones here. With the camera zoomed in, hopefully you get to see the detail fidelity found on the tracks. There are a couple of these little pins that are present on the molding, however, I'm pretty sure a pair of clean cut snips will make short work of those. The tracks are good quality, they have some nice elasticity to them. One thing on these tracks I want to point out right now, do not use spray paint to paint them. Standard El Cheapo flat black spray paint is a bad idea and will cause some crap to go sideways very quickly. For these tracks, paint them with Tamiya flat black and other type of acrylic type paints. Stay away from enamels and definitely don't use spray paint. So I'll be touching upon that as the video goes on, but I just wanted to stress that at this time here. Specifically AFV Club tracks, they do not like spray paints, so keep that in mind. But well, with the tracks out of the way, let's continue with the remainder of the parts. So the next parts bag gives you some more runners. These two here are basically superstructure pieces. I believe these are the exact same runners, just in duplicate. So we have a lot of pieces to hold up the boom, the winch, we have the brush guards, which are integrally molded right over there. The brush guards are a bit frail on this model here, and I'm gonna be touching upon that as the video goes on, because it's honestly the reason why I'm building this one, or I'm starting this one here. We also have some other components like pulleys, toe points, as well as the headlights. Headlights are again, nicely done. You can see the quality on them once the camera gets it to focus. And from what I remember, these pieces built very, very well. Moving down takes us to the suspension and here we have all of the torsion bars and swing arms found on a single runner. Pieces look pretty good, you know, pretty standard. If you built one Patton family of vehicle, you've pretty much seen them all. And again, nothing really much to talk about here. The bump stops, or I should say the spring bump stops look really good. And I'm not expecting any sort of surprises when it comes time to fit them to the lower hull. The next runner consists of the road wheels. I'm gonna open up the parts bag because we just have the rear faces of the wheels, but I'm pretty sure we're gonna wanna see what the front faces look like. So once the camera zooms in, you'll be able to see the pattern found on the road wheels. Of course, it has the M48 pattern of stamped steel road wheel, which is also the same on the M47, but you know, more about that later. The hubcaps are nicely molded, all of the fasteners are present and appear to be nicely rendered. The sprockets look good. I like the sunken fastener detailing. There are no mud slits that are present on these pieces here. So this is something I'm probably going to be adding myself. The idlers are similar in design to the Tamiya or the, the Academy pattern of idlers where we have the wheels that are separate and they're held in place by the stem, which is the hubcap. Yeah, it's again, pretty standard for these type of model kits. The other runner is the exact same type of tooling, so no point to go into that any further. And this brings us now to the last runner and it's also the largest found on this kit. So with the parts out of the bag, you get to see what they look like now in better focus. As I said before, this contains all of the larger components that are required to build the model out. So here we have the rear plate, the bulldozer blade, which is found on the front, the bulldozer blade mount, which has some real cool geometry to it, and the AV club kit did a real good job with getting all of those into proportion. We got some draw bars, smoke grenade launchers, Hatches for the crew and the two big side doors found on the, well, the side. We got the commander's cupola hatch as well as the hatch mounting ring. 
probably the largest piece on here. It's also the most fragile and something that you need to pay attention to is the main boom. The main boom is very nicely rendered out. And it, one thing that I like about it has all these little small little telephone pole style handle points found molded on. These are very finely molded, which is great because it gives some excellent detail. However, they are frail and fragile. And on top of that, to make matters worse, they are snag prone. This is the type of thing you will snag if you're not paying attention. So pay attention when handling this thing because one wrong move and these pieces will go peek, peek, peek and you're screwed. So that is something to keep aware of. But as for the piece themselves, very nicely molded, and it's a nice detailing to have on the out-of-the-box components. Also on the same runner, we have an M2HB 50 cal with the really cool flash suppressor on the end. The ammo box holder with the ammo box, and yes, the rounds are exposed, which is, it makes great for painting when you're completing it, when you're painting the ammo belt and all that good stuff. Spade grips are molded separately, which is pretty common. And yeah, we have some other things like Pioneer tools and other generic stuff like that. Overall, again, these kits are just nicely rendered and nicely engineered overall. And it's going to be a blast building this one. So on the bottom of the box, oh, looks like we got some more goodies. Well, you know what? Apparently I was wrong with my previous statement when I said there's no PE on this kit. There indeed is. So let's go ahead and open up this little baggie over here. So the first runner in the bag is a set of spare track links. It's molded in the same material that AAV Club uses for the workable track links. In fact, I believe these are actually from that runner. My memory's a little hazy, but I remember there being some spares found. And these ones have their clamps integrally molded on, which is perfect and should work very well once mounted to the side of the vehicle. We have a set of rubber poly caps right over here. The rubber is the same type of rubber used for the single piece vinyl tracks and it's very springy. It's very Tamiya-ish with the design of the row wheels, how they go into place. So it's, that's actually something that's really good. And here we got some PE. The PE replicates mesh work and I believe if I'm not mistaken these are for various locations found on the boom, namely this one over here. And I think these ones here are just heat shields for some of the other equipment found on the vehicle. But again, excellent, excellent quality of pieces right here on this fret. Also in the bag, we have some lengths of rope or string, I should say. Obviously, this is going to be used for both the winch as well as the boom itself. And one really cool thing we have is a length of chain. The chain is made out of copper with some brass hardware on it. We have the main loop over here fabricated out of a piece of bent metal rod and it's a nice bit of tooling. Very nicely done. The geometry is really good. And again, this is just some really high quality stuff that's supplied with this kit. The chain work is also the, the type of shape of the chain looks really, really good too. So. Again, these kits, I can't stress enough, really did hold up very well with age. Come to think of it, I think it's safe to say that back in the day, this kit here would have been considered one of the super kits of the era. And in the very bottom of the bag, we have a set of water slide decals. And here you can see all the options available that are present. We have options for the US military, the Taiwanese military, as well as the Bundeswehr. Not sure how well the markings are gonna hold up once applied to the model. I've had some mixed results with AFV Club markings in the past. However, I believe the problem that I had with the one set was because of the condition the model was in, as opposed to just the quality of the decals themselves. As I built a few other AFV Club kits, and the decals were just fine. It was just that one example that gave me a bit of a problem. But you know, we'll see how that cookie crumbles as the, well, actually that's a poor term because I don't want the, the, anything to crumble. We'll see how that pans out as the video goes on. And here we have the instruction manual. And yes, this appears to be a manual. It's nice and thick. It appears that AV Club has changed this at some point 
Looks like in 2003 they must have made an addendum to it. Maybe for the extra markings, but here we go. If anyone has seen the old school AV Club instructions, this is what they look like. And the one on the Vietnam version was basically similar to this. Oh, by the way, um, James Chung, Mr. World War Tunes out there. Uh, it looks like uh, something <laughs> you would have came up with on one of your model kits. It's a World War Tunes eyes uh, M88. Uh, Markings look to be pretty good. And it should be interesting to see how the model pans out. Of course, if there are any sort of issues with the printing or if there's something that's a little vague or wrong, I'll be glad to point that out at, towards the end of the video. And here we have some of the markings in their color charts. And usually at this point, I'll be done with the unboxing, but we're not done yet because, holy hell, AMV Club are the masters of marketing, and they even use the bottom portion of the box for more marketing. So we got some more really cool box arts of kits that they produce, anything from German armored cars to the T-34, a Bundeswehr version of the Duster, the American version of the Duster, a Churchill T-3485, M109, the Valentine, several Churchills, and yes, even an LVT. So AFV Club was always one for coming out with really cool kits. So here's the model, basically ready for painting. I gotta say, this build, although the kit itself is excellent, for some reason I've been having a bunch of bad luck on this one here. It's not representative with the kit itself, it's just more or less, I don't know, maybe I, I stepped on too many cracks in the sidewalk or something. But regardless, I had to put a little bit extra effort into this one compared to some of the other builds that have been seen on the channel in the past. However, let's briefly go over what had to be done at this point here because this is going to reflect on what needs to be added to it in order to get this thing fully completed. So starting with the main body itself, the model here, for all intents and purposes, is basically completed. One thing that's really cool about the AFV Club kit is a lot of the functionality that this kit has out of the box. Such things would include the hatches here, which are fully functional, although there is no interior detailing supply with the kit, but oddly enough, there is an aftermarket set that is out there on the market. So for something like this, it's actually, you know, maybe something to look into because of the functional hatches. For this build, however, obviously I'm not gonna go that route. The hatches do function straight out of the box. There's no other tweaking or modifications being necessary. However, I have to stress, just like what is present on lots of other AFE Club kits that I've done in the past, the plastic is very finely molded and it's also a very frail plastic. And because of that, you have to be really, really careful on how you separate some of the hinges and also some of the hatch components in order to get them cleaned up and fitted in place and then done in a way which is functional. But if you take your time and if you are proper with the skill sets, you should be able to get them to work just fine. While on functionality, the top hatches over here are also fully functional. In order to make these function, I had to use what I've done on many of the older Tamiya builds that I've mentioned in the past, where with a soldering iron, you go ahead and you heat the little piece of plastic that emerges from the bottom portion of the roof. And then once that material is removed, the hatch stays in place, but as you can see, is fully functional. This is done with the two bow hatches that we have here. In addition to the hatches being made functional, we have the center hatch over here, which is the cover cap for the winch, which obviously is very important for this power in a vehicle, and this too is fully functional as well. What's interesting to point out is that it's held on with only one little hinge right there off center, and because of that, when you're trying to open it, it tends to want to open up in a canted manner on you. Uh, one thing that's very cool about the AFE Club kit, and this is also true on the real one, is that there's a small little notch cut into the rear portion here of the hatch itself, and that is done so that you can have the cable hooked up in the retracted state, and it has the proper clearance for the cable to run across the top deck over here and to the pulley system, which is, again, true to form to the real unit. So that's definitely something that was nicely executed by AFE Club. Also on the topic of functionality, it takes to the commander's cupola. The cupola is fully operational in that you can open the commander's hatch 
like so. But another trick that this kit has is that the MG ring, which is a evolved version from the, you know, late production Sherman tank cupolas, can actually, on the real unit, pivot 360 degrees. Well, on the AFV club kit here, they don't really mention that, and they, you know, have the instructions to glue it on in a straight midships manner. However, if you don't apply a drop of glue, the tolerances are so snug on this piece over here that you can just simply press it on with just friction and it'll hold it in place and you can still have some functionality to it. On a similar note, if you don't want to go that route and you do want to glue it in place, one trick that I recommend that'll give a little bit of extra personality to your build, it looks like the hatch is popping out a little bit, I'll take care of that later. Uh, one thing I want to mention is with the personality of the build, if you just glue the piece amidships like this here, yeah, obviously that's something that would be seen on the real unit. However, basically every single person out there who builds an M88 doesn't realize that this thing can fully rotate. And because of that, generally when you see these, the MG is always mounted straight ahead. Obviously, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, it's a little bit conventional, shall I say. If you're building this and you want to have your build have a little bit more extra character, just glue the piece on off center or to the side. A simple little trick like that is a really easy way to get a little bit of more intrigue and a little bit more character on your build and it'll really make it stand from the pack from your standard built out of the box AFV Club M88. Also, while on the cupola, you can see the pintle mount extender right over there. Uh, this is something that had to have been scratch built because the one I had that was supplied with the kit flung off the Lost Partia when I was polishing it off, and so a new one needs to have been fabricated. Uh, Lost Partia population grew quite a bit with this build over here, which you will see momentarily, but uh, this piece here was just fabricated out of some turned resin that I had. I turned it to the appropriate diameter and shape, and then I went ahead and drilled it out on the lathe basically recreating the original component. Once everything's fully painted and weathered, it's just gonna blend in with the remainder of the detailing. On a, another similar note to Lost Partia residents, we have here these two brush guards. The brush guards did not fling off the Lost Partia, they just straight up broke during removal from the sprue. As I touched upon before with these AFE Club kits, very finely molded brush guards and things like that tend to be extremely frail and it's not uncommon to break or screw them up during just simple extraction. For this model over here, that was the case with one of the examples. However, when I lost one of them, I might as well go ahead and replace both of them just to keep proper continuity. Fortunately, the brush guards are ridiculously simple in their overall geometry and they were easily fabricated out of a piece of floral wire. I just bent it to the exact same shape as one that I had that was intact, and then they just went to the appropriate locations. Obviously, the sections on the top here were drilled out with a pin vise in order to have the proper depth for the metal to get secured in place, and secured in place in a firm manner. As for the antenna bases, both of them have been drilled out. This one here is going to have some wire put in, but this is something I'm going to be discussing after the model is fully completed. And the standard spring antenna base here had the center portion drilled out with a pin vise again for the same reason too, hooking it up with some wire for the antenna detailing. Again, you will see what this looks like later on in the video. Moving rearward takes us to some periscope details, and you will quickly notice that one of them isn't like the other because... This one here is a resin copy of this example because the original resin one went ahead and flung off to Lost Partia and a new one was required in order to finish it. The piece is also something that's relevant to point out is that the kit wants you to install them, I believe, upside down. It's very well labeled in the instructions how the orientation is. However, if you compare and contrast that with real M88s, they tend to be in the format that we have here. And this is something that I do want to mention. And if you are working on these AFV Club M88s, you do want to keep that in mind. Moving rearward takes us to the vise, which is a nice little bit of tooling. I like the way it was rendered on the AFV Club kit where it's a three-piece construction. You have the base that's integrally molded to the upper hull. You have the main body of the vise. And then you also have the second portion of the vise there with the handle that's all separately molded. This allows you to position the vise in a multitude of configurations. Just like what I mentioned before with the cupola where if you want to add some 
intrigue to your build, don't mount it in just a straight manner as it is found on the instructions. And you could do something like what I did over here and you just simply mount it off center. It's just, again, to, a way to add an extra bit of personality to the build. In this area over here, you will also see some other components that are not kit supplied. The kit does supply you with the components for these triangular handles that you see here on either side and also the lock for the boom that would clamp down in that location right over there. The pieces are supplied with the kit. However, again, with AFV Club parts being what they are, they are so incredibly frail and fragile that removing them off the sprue was unsuccessful and they were heavily damaged. So I went ahead and tooled up direct replacements out of HD 3D print. I am going to be circling back onto that momentarily, but rest assured, there are some replacements out there now that can replace any of these pieces that I just touched upon. Nothing really too much going on back here, with the exception of, again, another hook being teleporting to Lost Partia. But no, actually, that's not true. The part didn't teleport to Lost Partia. There's actually a mistake in the instructions. The component for the hooks over here is mislabeled. And because of that, you will try to insert the wrong little shackle point on the wrong location and you're going to quickly notice that it doesn't fit. Well, I didn't realize what was going on so I went ahead and carved the material away in order to get to fit into the wrong location and because that the part was ruined. It wasn't until after part was glued on I realized what was the case and so I needed to uh, scrounge a replacement. Fortunately I still had another one of these pieces on the runner. I went ahead took it off, make a mold of it, and cast it a fresh one, which you can see right here. If you're working on one of these M88s, you want to keep that in mind. Now, I'm not sure if this was something that was also seen on the Vietnam release of the M88. I believe they actually had that corrected in that release, but on the standard M88 here, yes, that is something you do want to pay attention to. Moving our way to the front of the model gives us more functionality, namely the bulldozer blade, which is a nicely engineered piece, and also the front winch which again nicely engineered and with the way it's designed you do have the ability to have it in the retracted or extended state also the little roller here is fully functional as well it's a nice little bit of engineering on the remainder of the details basically everything here is stock at the moment the one thing that i did improve slightly are the smoke grenade launchers which are an iconic bit of detailing on 1970s 1980s era of u.s military vehicles the pieces are Quite standardly molded, best way to put it, they are on par with the other kits of the era from Tamiya or Academy, which means Tamiya for that matter. And one improvement that I like to do is on the locations where the actual smoke grenades go, I like to drill them out with a pin vise. The way the kit is, they are molded shallow, which again makes the pieces easy to mold. But in order to squeeze a little bit of extra realism out of the build, with a pin vise, you just simply drill these sections out, and once the procedure is completed, you really get to see how much deeper everything looks, and obviously this will really come out after everything is fully painted and weathered, which obviously you'll see towards the latter half of the video. On that note, another bit of detailing that I added was the firing cable, which emerges from the center portion of the grenade cluster, and then it enters into the hull in a rather unceremoniously done way, but this is just done with a small piece of floor wire, bent the shape, added to two little holes that were drilled into the two corresponding locations, and that leaves it for the detailing that you see here. It's always something to do on builds that feature smoke grenade launchers like this, and it's an easy way to add a little bit of extra detailing. There's one last thing I want to mention about the front, but I'll touch upon that momentarily. I just want to circle now to the sprockets. Oop. Okay, back to the sprockets. Uh, the sprockets are very easily assembled. They're basically on parts of what you'll see on other patent-based vehicle kits, either from Tamiya Academy or even the modern Dragon kits for that matter. No, that's actually not true. They're much easier to assemble than those other ones. But regardless, they are easily assembled. But one thing that they are missing, and this is again true for basically the vast majority of these patent-based kits out there on the market, are the mud slits found on the outer drum portion here of the sprocket. The mud slits here are an iconic bit of detailing found in this pattern of vehicle, and they were simply added with a Dremel. I have to carefully mark the locations, being both the height and also the, the areas that the mud slits are found on. And on a M60 or an M48 pattern vehicle, they are in a tri configuration like you see here. So trying to figure out the orientation is not going to be very difficult. The way I like to do is I take the sprocket before it is assembled, put the 
stem in the in the lathe, spin it so I could go ahead and mark the locations with a pencil. This will give me perfectly straight areas where the confines are going to be. And then once I go ahead and mark the the vertical locations, I can then remove the material. This is done via a Dremel with a really small router bit. And once the material is removed, you get the look that you see here. And it's an easy way to add that much more extra realism to the build. And as I often say in these videos, if this is something that you don't feel like you have the nerve or the skill to attempt, don't try it. This is an easy way to ruin the sprocket if you don't have your fundamentals down. Fortunately, if this is the case, you can still make out because like I often mentioned, not all of these sprockets had the mud slits present. There are several examples out there of M60s and M48s that have a casting for the outer section here that are mud slitless. So this is another avenue to take if you don't have the nerve or the experience to go ahead and add those bits of details. However, if you do, you really can't go wrong and it always helps the look of these builds at the end of the day. The next thing that we have is a, another saga of a piece lost to lost party and that involves the oxygen tank here for the acetylene torch. The oxygen container is a two-piece assembly so there's some seam work to contend with. Nothing too egregious and obviously like the way I mentioned in my barrels I do in the same format. Glue two halves together, throw some super glue on the seams, polish them down and then paint once completed. As you can see, the seams have been thoroughly blended away. This actually took two coats where I first painted it and there's still some remembrance left. Hit it again with the wet sanding and the super glue. Second coat of paint, boom, the seam work was removed. However, one thing that is missing is the cover cap for the, for the valve. And this is supplied with kits, actually pretty decently rendered, but of course it got a one-way ticket to Lost Partia and it's no longer with us. So I need to go ahead and make a replacement. This is going to be a recurring theme on this video. But before I do that, I now want to mention the front brush guards. As I touched upon before, the M88 kit, the reason why I'm starting this one here is because a buddy of mine has this exact same kit and ran into a problem with the brush guards. He was trying to remove them off the sprue, completely botched them up, and because of that, he wasn't able to finish the build. Contact me, see if I could help him out with that. Well. I was more than happy to do that. And to do that, I actually needed to take the ones that are supplied on this model over here, measure them, and go ahead and recreate them in CAD. And, well, when I was trying to measure them off the sprue, I need to remove them off of the sprue, and lo and behold, I ran into the same problem. The brush guards are just so frail and fragile. Seam removal is, or I should say, sprue removal is a task in itself. Honestly, if you're using clean cut snips, you're gonna screw them up. You can't use clean cut snips in order to remove the brush guards. Oddly enough, the way I was able to do it was with a Dremel, with a really small Dremel bit, or in this case, a small router bit. And what I have to do, I actually carve the brush guard off of the sprue with the piece here, leaving you know a bit of remembrance over the, the brush guard itself. Once that is done, with a needle file and some sandpaper, I just polish the thing down and you can screw up about 10 different ways when you're doing this procedure. Fortunately, I had pretty good luck with the remainder of the brush guards, namely the ones here on the rear section, which are molded in the same type of frail material. These ones here I got lucky with, and I didn't have any issues, knock on wood. And I also had a little bit of a snafu, but I was able to recover it on this one over here on the front. The third leg was destroyed during the removal process. Fortunately, the remainder of the guard was in perfect shape so i was able to just salvage what i had and the missing section here was replaced with a thin strip of aluminum that i cut the shape and mounted in location so this brings us back to the brush guards well for the brush guards i needed to go ahead and make them in cad and that is what i have right over here this here is going to be a new addition to the eastcoastarmory.com 135th scale product line these are replacement headlight brush guards and other various fittings for the AFV Club M88. With one set, you clearly have more than enough for one vehicle, and this was done on purpose because these pieces are pretty frail and fragile. Me being a modeler, I do know, uh, you know, snafus are a thing, so I went ahead and covered your bases. So you have plenty of duplicates in case, you know, you mess a couple up during installation. Regardless, they are all made identical and they have all of the 
detailing on them, which includes both the geometry and even the thickness of the components. It's going to be interesting to see how they remove off the sprue and secure in place, so we're all going to be discovering that together. But as you can see here, they are something that can really help the build, specifically if you botch up the stock ones that are supplied with the kit. Also, you can see that I went ahead and designed the caps for the oxygen tank. Although I only needed one, since I had the real estate available, screw it, I went ahead and supplied many others. Now, this set here is a pre-production sample. This is just for me and my uh, friend who needed a set, so I'm going to basically split this in half, give him the other four, and four are going to be for this one over here. And another thing I want to mention is with the other components that I touched upon before. And since I have the CAD files on hand, I might as well go ahead and include these bits of equipment here onto the set because, well, again, I have the CAD files. And since these are easily destroyed on the stock tooling, you know, it would behoove you to have some spares on hand for a what if emergency type scenario. So the set itself is going to change from the format that we have here, but again, it's going to be because you're going to be getting more components. And I'll probably throw a thumbnail in over here of what the final set looks like with a nice CAD rendering. Regardless, here's what the components look like. Note the arrowhead style travel lock. For the component over here, I was actually able to study a real M88 or good, I found some several excellent photographs on the internet on one of these pieces up close. So I was able to take as much of that detailing as possible and incorporate them into the replacement part. We also have those iconic American triangular lifting hooks right over here, and they have the hinge detailing present as well, along with the appropriate round blunt bends for all of the triangular sections. And obviously these components here are all printed in HD material, which would be the best material for the detailing and size that these pieces are rendered in. The parts, like I said before, are found on the ECA Shapeway store. This is where I find, or where I find, this is actually where I list all of my non 1.6 and 1.16 scale detail upgrades and components, and they can be found via the link listed below. However, that's not the end of the story, because as it turns out, when I was developing the brush guards over here, I didn't realize that my caliper forgot the metric system, which was something I touched upon in one of the King Tiger Project Update videos where instead of the unit being the correct scale, it was actually underscaling things quite a bit. So much so that my first rendition of the brush guards came out, and they came out way, way too tiny. These pieces here are completely worthless for my needs, and if I was to take a guess, I'd say they're anywhere between 148 scale, maybe 172. It's hard to say offhand, but obviously there's no M88s in either of these scales. However, these things aren't doing anything in my shop, so if anybody wants this underscaled set over here, hit me up. You know, 10 bucks shipping included in the US, and uh, the set's yours. Obviously, first come, first serve. I know it, this is a, you know, a shot in the dark here, but hey, if anyone has a need for these things, you know, hit me up. They're obviously made in the same HD material that the proper sets are actually pr produced in. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to release them in the or onto the ECA catalog. It's just, I don't even, I'm not even sure if they'll even print out. These pieces are very, very tiny. The wall thicknesses are what they are, but obviously they print it out actually quite fine for this set over here, but sometimes Shapeways is a little uh, finicky when it comes to thinnesses on parts. But regardless, this set here is in existence. If anyone wants it, hit me up via the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Starting with the model suspension, the running gear, all the components that you see here are stock and assemble without any sort of problems. One thing I like about the row wheels is that they went with a Tamiya pattern of assembly where we have the poly caps in the center, which makes painting and installing them really, really easy. The pieces just plug in place without any glue really necessary. On the sprockets, as I mentioned before, I added the oval mud slits, but here you can see what they look like with the model fully completed. As I mentioned before, these always have the effect of adding so much extra detailing to your patent family of vehicle, and it's one that once done, it never disappoints. Again, with the caveat that you have the tooling and the skill to go ahead and execute such a task. If not, you can leave it alone, and still the piece will be perfectly fine. 
Some other things to mention are with the weathering, you'll see that on this build over here, I went with the sweaty bearing effect that I touch upon in a number of my other military vehicle videos. And for this one here, it was done in the exact same manner for basically the exact same type of results. One thing that I always mention is that you are going to utilize this technique. You want to stagger and you want to make sure that the pieces are as random as possible and you don't want to do the same type of weathering on every single wheel in the same locations as that can actually do a detrimental effect as opposed to helping your build. So that is something to keep in mind. From there, it takes to the track, and the track is the kit original track, and I loved the single piece vinyl tracks used on this model. They are excellent, and they were utilized without any sort of complications. The tracks themselves are painted and weathered in the format that is quite typically seen on my other military vehicles with a similar type of track design, and much along those type of builds, I, it, I utilize the exact same paints. As I mentioned before, do not use rattle can spray paint on these tracks. The vinyl does not like it. Now, on most other builds, I always recommend this. However, for the AFV Club tracks specifically, the rubber that their kits, or that these tracks are molded in, do not like that paint. Don't try it, don't do it, it'll be one of the worst things you can do on your build. For this one here, the entire tracks were first airbrushed with Tamiya flat black, and then I went ahead and painted the rust effects here with a paintbrush with some rust paint that I have. The rust paint is exterior latex. I touched upon this in my other OTR builds, but it's the same paint that's utilized, and I brush them on in the exact same locations as, again, as what would be represented on the real vehicle. On the real vehicle, the pads themselves on the front are rubber, and the metal end connectors are really what would rust specifically over time. On the inner portions here of the track, you can see that the inner pads are rubber, the tooth and the skettle sections of the track itself are metal, so they are also weathered in the exact same format as I frequently mention again in these videos. Once the components are painted in the format you see here, it always leads for a nice result and it makes the model look that much more realistic as opposed to just, you know, painting and weathering everything as rust. That's usually a common mistake that's done out there, mostly by beginners, but I've seen a few elevated builders do the same type of mistake. So if you are working on not just the M88 here, but the other vehicles with similar track, like the Abrams, the 60, the M48, the M26, and even the M483 EH Sherman, Pay attention to the track material that would be found on the real example. Moving along takes to the front bulldozer blade, and this is a very nicely designed piece found on the kit. What's cool is that the kit is designed to be fully functional, now you just pivot the piece down, and now you could render or display the model in this format. The inner detailing is all present, and it's all excellently rendered. The one thing I do want to touch upon, though, are the two little bumpers that we have right here and here. These are actually made from rubber, industrial rubber, specifically on the real units. And so on the model here, I painted them to replicate that material. There are a few other locations on this vehicle where there are rubber bump stops like this, and I'll be touching upon them as the video goes on. But as you can see, once everything is fully painted and weathered, it really does look the part quite well. The blade has its inner detailing as well. And again, everything assembles out of the box without any sort of complications. With the winch cable, this is something that is again, just lends itself to functionality. Now there's not a spool or anything else on the inside. It's just some loose rope that's just stuffed inside the model. But it has the effect where if you pull on it here, if you play your cards right and you give yourself enough length, which by the way, the kit does give you an ample amount of strength for, you can go ahead and pull the winch out like you see here. As for the cable of the winch, it has been painted and weathered accordingly, just to give it a little bit more of a detail accurate punch. When it's not in use, you simply just stuff it back into the model. It's a little tricky to get on camera, I'm just gonna get my knuckles on frame the whole time, but it, it does spool up, or I should say retract quite easily. You just stuff it into the build and you're basically all set. From there brings us to the front equipment here, and let me just zoom out the camera a little bit. As you can see, there is basically no inch on this model that isn't just cluttered with stuff, and that's just what makes this model all that much cooler and just dripping in details. The remaining front details takes us to the main headlights. Again, quite typical for US AFV 
of the post-war era. And the brush guards. Here you get to see those 3D printed brush guards in better light. And they turned out to be absolutely perfect. Once they are trimmed to shape, they just mount on as the kit one originally would. And definitely are a good alternative to the kit counterpart. Aside from the HD 3D printed components, we have here some other fittings like the lift rings, again, all stock, but we also have some sections here for the pulley mechanism for the boom. And with the way the kit is designed, you can, just like the real one, swap these out for the other one that you actually have on the boom. There are lots of ways you can render this build, and this is really best up left to the discretion of the builder. For this build here, I basically followed the format in the instructions, leaving for the, the rendition that you see presently. The components do get fitted on in place, and they do have their mounting equipment that's present on the kit. The one thing you have to keep in mind is that the mounting equipment is fairly finely molded, and because of that, it is a bit fragile. Not impossible to free and to deburr, but it is something to keep in mind. Also, one thing that you have to do on this build, and I can't stress this enough, is you have to have your sequence in parts laid out. A lot of people, when they build models for some reason, they tend to build the entire build, tools and equipment included, all on the model before the whole thing goes into paint, and that is just crazy. I still don't understand how people can do that. The reason why I say that is these pieces are painted differently from the vehicle, and if you go ahead and glue everything together before everything is painted, you're just really working harder in order to achieve a similar effect because now you have to paint this with a paintbrush. And by the way, you're going to miss areas. You're going to have sections that go on the back or in the sides, and you're not going to be able to get the paint over there, and it's just not going to look all that great. I cannot recommend this enough. Whenever you do a model like this or any type of build, when you have lots of equipment on it, paint the equipment separately off the model. At the tail end of the build, after the camouflage and the weathering and all that is done, then you go ahead and add the, the little final bits of equipment, leaving for a result that you see here, which in my opinion makes for a better built model in comparison to just gluing everything on and just trying to paint around. I just that, that technique just baffles me that people always attempt. But regardless, the way you see it here was how I just mentioned. As for the parts themselves, they are, again, very, very nicely detailed, arguably very finely molded. But again, if you take your time and if you have the perseverance to carefully deburr things and work with fiddly bits, they do assemble quite well and give you a good end result at the end. Carrying along to the sides of the model, you get to see more of the equipment, more pulleys, several spare wheels, both a uh, return roller wheel and a main road wheel. It is a reverse image on the opposite side. Here we have the fire extinguisher, and just like on all fire extinguishers, the handles are painted in red. I'm not sure that's going to come out in camera with this lighting, but rest assured, two little drops of red paint were added on those sections over there, and it always makes the model look good, and it's always an eye-catching bit of equipment that a lot of people just seem to forget. The detailing is there, guys. Just hit it with a paintbrush with a little bit of red paint, and you're done. Ta-da, and the model already looks better at the end. Uh, some other bits of equipment to mention is the tow cable that we have right over here. Again, the, the rope is supplied with the model and it assembles much along the lines as several of the Tamiya and Academy kits do, where we have two plastic end connectors and then you just simply mount the rope in place. The pieces assemble very well and once they are fitted to the model, they definitely look the part, specifically if you weather them accordingly, like the way I've done here. On my model here, I actually, I believe I gave just a little bit extra length compared to what it stressed in the instructions. Not because I don't know the metric system where, I'm, I'm, it's, admittedly, I'm an American, so I'm a little bit hazy on, on millimeters. But no, I actually purposely left it a little bit long just so it leaves for the loose type fitting result that you see here. On the model, when they... When you assemble it, it's going to be nice and taut, which if you, which looks great, but if you compare that to a real example, these cables are always a little bit on the looser end, and if you add a little bit of extra length to it, you get a, a result that's a little bit more realistic compared to the straight type cable that you'll see if you assemble it, well, as per the instructions. This is also, by the way, a mirror image on the opposite side in terms of both the equipment as well as also with the technique I mentioned with the string. Another thing I also want to mention is with the spare track 
that's located right over there. They were painted and weathered in the exact same format with the exact same paints, no less, as the ones on the main track bands. So the outcome is basically identical. The other thing I want to stress is with the clamps that are found right here on the end sections, be sure to paint them with the colors of the vehicle. You'll be surprised how many people out there forget to do that. Also on the side here, we have the two side doors. And as I touched upon before, they are technically able to be made functional if you really pay attention and are very careful with the build. This one here, I was able to get the unit to operate, as you can see. But just like with lots of other things from AFV Club, the plastic is so frail that it may or may not be able to be functional for long. This one here I got lucky. The one on the opposite side, I was less lucky where I did get the thing to work. However, after the layers of paint went on and the varnish, eh, the hinge decided to brittle up on me. Now, I'm not going to, it's still holding in place quite well. It holds well in the closed position. However, I'm not going to screw around with it and try to open it on camera. This one here, it opens up pretty decently. So this is something to keep in mind. And again, this type of trade here is present on a large number of AFV Club model kits, specifically the ones that I've built upon in the past. Continuing back takes us to the tow bar as well as the sprocket tooth ring. And this is where you do have several other options available as a builder to give the model just a little bit more extra character. For instance, on the draw bar over here, I went with a darker shade of olive drab as this is something that would be seen on these components from the era that preceded, well, the format that we have with, with the three-tone NATO. Keep in mind, these components, there's a large number of them on inventory. A lot of times they're still left in the original paint and wouldn't be uncommon to see other older components fitted to modern vehicles, or I should say vehicles with a more modern spec camouflage. And it's a way to add just that much more extra character to your build. This is always something you gotta keep in mind when you're working on a build, not just this one per se, but any other tank build out there. A lot of times you'll have a lot of similarities where you have components like this, and when done, it definitely breaks up the monotony. I could have easily painted this with the same shade of NATO green as the remainder of the vehicle, or it could even blend it in with the camouflage pattern. That can be done too, to a certain extent, but you know, if you want to go ahead and change a park with a certain type of green, it definitely looks good and adds to the character to build in my opinion. On the sprocket rings, I believe I, I painted them with a different shade of green too. I went with a olive green as opposed to NATO green. I'm not sure if it really pops out once everything is painted and weathered, but it is again, another way to add just a little bit more variation to the build. On that note, we also have here the tool rack. The tools are the kit supply ones and went on without any sort of problems. For the tools, you'll notice that the entire tool is overpainted with the olive green paint. This is a commonly seen thing found on American military vehicles, specifically post-World War II American military vehicles. You don't really see the wooden handles on the furniture so much as you would on like vehicles during World War II. And even during World War II, wouldn't it be uncommon to see tools overpainted with olive drab as well. But for a modern pattern vehicle, from what I've seen on surplus components, as well as even just pictures of real military vehicles that are in National Guard service or even active duty, uh, you tend not to see the wooden handles left in their natural color more often than not. Carrying along takes it to probably one of my favorite uh, sections on the M88, and that's the rear portion. So starting with the chain that we have here, this is the kit supply chain, and it went on without any sort of problems. Just like with the other piece I mentioned, I went ahead and changed the color up a little bit by going with a darker shade of olive drab. And this shade here, I believe, is even different from the other shades of olive drab that I touched upon on the other parts. Again, just giving just that much more variation. We have another draw bar right over here on the bottom portion. And one thing I do want to revisit about this is the chain needs to be done again at the tail end of the build after everything's painted and weathered. And if you're going to do that, you have to leave certain other details off, namely the draw bar here. If you try to mount the draw bar on before the the chain, you're not going to be able to fit the chain in place. So this is something where you need to have the sequence properly done in order to get the parts to fit in place. Also in this location over here, you get to see the rubber mud flaps that I mentioned earlier. Since the model has been completed, you get to see what the mud flaps look like now, fully painted and weathered. This is another thing to keep in mind that several other people out there might not know about the composition and might just overpaint it with the paint and the camo. Although this is something that is not, again, necessarily inaccurate as, you know, when these things get repainted specifically in secondary service, you know, just, they just overspray everything. But 
Uh, again, keep in mind, if you're going to weather it, you want to weather it accordingly, that it's rubber and not metal. And that is something that to be aware of. On my builds, I always like to have the rubber parts just in their natural rubber coloring, so I went with that format for this build for both accuracy reasons and also, in my opinion, gives just that much more color pop to the build, as opposed to, again, just leaving everything overpainted with the remainder of the paintwork. Moving up brings us to the grill area. Again, probably the coolest grill found on any military vehicle, and the AFV Love One assembles very well. It assembles in layers, and if you follow the instructions, you should have some pretty decent results. Also, on this portion over here, you get to see this shelf, and again, the shelf is a little bit vague with the instructions on how those struts get mounted on it, but I was able to find some pictures of the real unit, and I was able to work from there. Clearly, you'll see the exhaust soot build up on these sections over here, as one would imagine it would build up quite quickly and quite numerously, specifically when this vehicle is in operation. And the way you see it here is very prototypical of how you would see real examples. So from the exhaust takes us to the remaining headlights, or I should say the taillights, and you can see that there are quite a bit of lights found in this section over here, from an infrared light to the standard USA V cat lens or cat eye taillights. Of course, the one on the right hand side is blacked out, and this is something that I frequently mention in these videos. The brush guards on the rear ones are very, very frail, as are the ones on the front. However, I was able to have good luck with removing these off of the sprue, and I didn't run to any problems with breakage as I did with the front ones, which necessitated the need of 3D printed replacements. So, if you are working on this build, be aware that these guards here are eh, a bit on the fiddly end, and uh, yeah, you do have to stay on the ball when it comes time for removing them off of the sprue. Moving topside takes to the engine deck, and first you can see those HD 3D printed triangular handles that are found on each side. Once everything's fully painted and weathered, they just blend right into the remainder of the detailing and are a dead ringer for the original kit ones. You can also see the really cool and iconic vise that's right there on the rear deck. You know, it was painted and weathered in the format that you see here. And again, I just, one of those other accoutrements I just love on the M88. And this leads us to the other bump stop that I was referring to. So, as I mentioned before, there are bump stops found on the front that deaden the, the bulldozer blade when it goes up into its retracted position. Well, the same thing is found right here on the boom supports that would pivot upward. Right here, there's this little slab that's found on this section here of the mount, and on the real unit, this would be made out of rubber. So, on this one here, I went ahead and painted rubber to show the material difference. Again, a little bit of detailing is what really spices up your build as opposed to just ignoring it. And also doesn't take that much work. Just a little swipe of paint and you're all set. Same thing is true for the opposite side. And this leads us to the remainder of the grill work. Again, the grill work is very nicely rendered on this build and a lot of Tamiya panel line accent was added to this area over here, really allowing that grill work molding to come out in further light. On this portion over here, we get to see some of those heat shields that I was touching upon before. These are made out of photo etch and they are very nicely rendered out. They bend well, paint well, and then secure on without any sort of adjustment issues. On these components here, these were not varnished, and I'll circle upon that later on when I go over the paint, but all of the PE was added at the very last installment of the build. And this was done even after the varnish because these components over here, painting, weathering, and just completing them is always problematic, or not problematic, but tricky because of the little preparations on them. They plug up with paint very, very easily. And same is also true for not just these, but other PE type grill sets, things like on the Panther or on the Tiger. Whenever you have small mesh work, paint is always a bit trickier because of the propensity to plug up these little holes. There are some skill sets out there that I talk about in the, actually I just did that in the Yak Panther OTR video that just was recently posted, and there I show the technique on how to paint photo etch and give you some, well I should say give you the best chance of having the PE painted without the, the holes being plugged up. For these ones over here, I didn't even try with the varnish because the varnish is just, it's just not going to pan out too well, or at least from my experience. So for this one here, once the units were painted and weathered, after the model was varnished, these were some of the last components to be fitted in place. Once they are fitted in place though, they do look excellent. 
So we have this one right over here, and then we have that other one that's right over there on the bottom portion. And as you can see, all the perforations are there without any sort of holes being plugged up. Same is also true for the basket right over here on the A-frame, which you'll see in better light once I deploy the boom. And while on that topic, I am going to deploy it, but however, before I do, I want to go ahead and touch upon that travel lock that we have right here. With that travel lock, you do have the option to position it in a way where it looks like it's holding it in place, however, it's really not. If you are going to model this component, or I should say model this vehicle permanently in the retracted state, well then you can go ahead and secure the piece a little bit tighter on this section over here, which would hold the whole boom in the retracted state. But if you do that, I also recommend adding a drop of glue on these two sections over here, firmly solidifying it where it needs to be. For this one here, the boom is functional, and well, let me go ahead and walk through the deploying procedure because it's a little bit more tricky than one might imagine. So, what makes this really tricky is the fact that it's just a tangle of cables, and you have to be very, 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 very careful, I cannot stress that enough, when you're opening this up because these things just love to snag on stuff and the stuff they're going to snag on are very small, very frail, very fragile, and are very hard to replace. So, it's a perfect storm. In addition to that, circling back to the little grab handles that we have here on the sides, you got to be careful where you even pick, touch this thing because these will just snap off with the easiest convenience. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab it from the winch, or I should say the pulley over here, and I'm going to carefully pull up. Alrighty, right here I can see if I pull up anymore I'm going to have a problem because that cable is snagging around the travel lock. So, you have to snake that around. You have to basically baby this thing up with every sixteenth of an inch. I'm, I'm not messing around. So, that has been Fred pulling up. Okay, and with the way I last retracted it, I was able to fold the cables carefully in a way where they shouldn't snag too much. Ah, but there's another snag point, the M2HB. So I'm just gonna loosen a little bit. Move this cable around this fella here. Actually, I'll, move, I'll rotate the whole 50 out of the way. Give me a moment. All right, so that has been Fred over there. Now I'm gonna, again, carefully Raise this thing. You're gonna notice how these things automatically deploy when the unit gets elevated, as per the real unit. And once I hit a certain point here, I'm just gonna add just a little bit of tension on it. Just a little bit of extra tension, just to make sure that the strings are nice and taut, and that the boom is fully extended. And there we go, the unit is now in its deployed state. With the unit fully deployed, you really get to see just how much larger this model becomes. The model itself is already a decent sized model, but with the boom extended, I mean, it's basically from the tip of my fingers uh, stopping shy of my elbow area. So it is a quite large model in this regard, which is also really, really cool. All of these lengths of string, by the way, that are used to get the unit deployed to this state have to be carefully measured out. And fortunately, the kit does do an excellent job with letting you know exactly the lengths of string that are going to be needed in order to get the model to this position. The other thing I want to mention is with the rigging of the pulley, which, well, let me go ahead and bring the camera in closer so you get a better idea on how it's executed. Probably the most tricky aspect of this build is with rigging up the pulley. There is a certain format that this thing has to go where it goes up and down and up and down has to go over the wheel that we have up here and then has to go back down and then finally it ends right here on the center portion. It is properly arranged however with the way the kit is you need some kind of a weight on the end or else the piece is just going to want to twist on you like the way it's doing on me at the moment. However the way you do see it is the way that it's illustrated in the instructions, and the instruction does a decent job with letting you know exactly how to rig it up, but it's even though, I mean, it's the best that they're going to be able to do in a paper type instruction format. If you take your time and carefully, you know, go through the motions, you should be able to rig it up like the way I've done here, and I actually got it right on the first try without any sort of problem, so... Uh, yeah, if you are working on one of these units, rest assured the instructions will be your friend in this regard, 
but you have to take your time. Do that, and you'll be able to get this thing rigged up in a manner which eh, should leave you with most of the hairs left on your head. Uh, it wasn't that bad, but it is, again, one of the most trying aspects of this build compared to just the, the other remainder of the model, which is more or less a standard model kit. Uh, if you're a shipbuilder out there, specific one that does sail ships, you're probably laughing at me at the moment. But uh, yeah, for armor people, we don't really do a whole lot of string stuff. So regardless, uh, yeah, it is one of the more interesting aspects of the build. With the boom fully assembled, this leads us back to the rear engine deck, and now you get a better view of all the details at hand. Which includes another pulley, the, the crowbars, as well as that photo wedge mesh that I referred to earlier. Over there is the fuel filler cap. Of course, I weathered it in my spilled, sweaty type effects that I always mention on these builds. And this takes us to the oxygen tank for the oxyacetylene torch. For the oxygen tank, you do have several options available on how to render it. Uh, first and foremost, they are basically almost always green in color, you know, oxygen. I have seen them painted in tan, and for this one here, I went ahead and painted it with the top portion in red. This was actually taken off of a real oxy or U.S. surplus oxyacetylene tank that I saw on the internet. And the same is also true for the cover cap. The cover cap is painted in this light color green. And it's one that also adds just, again, that much more color and flair to the build. On the cover cap, this is the HD 3D printed one from ECA. Or I should say it's found on the ECA set. The piece is fully hollow. And you can see that it has nice depth to it. Now that's fully painted and fitted in place. And the engine just drops directly into place without any real sort of modifications required on the tank itself. I think perhaps you may need to drill the hole out on the portion so that it plugs in uh, easier, but outside of that, the piece is basically more or less a drop in install. For the oxygen label itself, this is a water slide decal and it gets installed on without any sort of problems, which I'll be circling uh, back to that momentarily. Moving up takes to the main cupola hatch, and as I mentioned before, this one here is fully functional. If I could just carefully. I'm really trying to be careful not to break something, guys. This is a very frail model. But there you go. The hatch is still fully functional. And as I mentioned before, the 50 cal can pivot as I didn't glue it in place. And uh, let me just go ahead and close that hatch first. And then you can see me pivot the MG like I am right now. Which is a cool feature that is one that some people, again, might not even necessarily know that the model can actually have. The tolerances are so tight, the piece just friction fits in there, man. It's a decent fit. The M2HB itself is now fully painted and weathered. And as I often mention, I like the red Bakelite look for the, the grips. The ammo can is left open, so the rounds were painted in my usual format, where I use three colors for this. I use a gold paint to paint the brass, uh, the brass casings. I use a swipe of black to to replicate the disintegrating link belt. And then a swipe of copper paint is used to paint the projectiles. At least for a nice realistic effect, and it's one that, well, again, just helps to build overall. This version does have that really cool flash suppressor on the end, and I went ahead and drilled the unit out, giving just that much more added detailing to the piece. On this side here, you can see the antenna bases. Note on this one here, I went ahead and painted it a slightly different color of dark olive drab. These pieces would be plastic on the real units and seeing them in different colors would be more or less common. For the antenna wire itself, this would be a rubber material on the real unit. And you can see I went ahead and rendered just a little piece of wire. On this one over here, this was painted in green as is again commonly seen. And also the antenna wire itself is green on this one because on later or I should say more modern versions of American military vehicles, the antenna wires themselves would be a NATO green coloring. To cover the remainder of the top, I am now going to retract the boom, and this needs to be done equally as careful, but in the opposite direction. I am going to pivot the MG out of the way, though. Now it's making contact with the antenna, which, yep, that's... on the real one would just swing out of the way because it's on a spring, but... Okay, so to do that, the 50 is repositioned. On this side over here, there's no handle, so it's a nice place to use as a position to pivot everything. So 
I'm going to go ahead and pivot it downward. Now when I do, you're going to see that the cables are going to start bending or uh, wrapping around the, the deck. And I'm actually going to go ahead and make sure that they don't do that. So let me get my hands out of the way. I'm going to pull back like this. Just guiding everything into the closed state. Okay, so when I get to this format over here, I'm going to go ahead and just loop them back around. And when I'm doing so, I'm just making sure that they don't tangle up with stuff. Oh, before I do, there's the travel lock, the HD3D printed one, as I touched upon before. And as you can see, once fully painted and weathered, it's a dead ringer for the original piece. And if anything, I think I have better geometry on this one compared to the original ones found on the model. But a quick plug out of the way. Let's go ahead and get this guy back in place. These two hooks over here, or I should say these two eyelets over here are freely pivoting, so you want to make sure that, you know, they, they don't snag up on stuff. I like to bend the cables down into this type of format where they retract into these areas here on the engine deck. Like so. And once I see everything is nice and clear, go ahead and position it down and the unit is now fully retracted. Now I'm not sure if anyone out there who serves on one of these can tell me but if I'm not mistaken I wouldn't be surprised this can because I've seen pictures on the internet where this thing is just lying right here on the rear engine of the engine deck but I think it can also be put here into this little basket that we have right there but regardless the unit is fully retracted or it's as retracted as I'm going to be able to get it, which is fully attracted actually. It looks like it did pretty well. Okay, so here you get to see that basket now in better light. And again, the perforations are all very finely molded in or uh, etched out in the brass and it just looks very, very nice. The piece does fold together pretty easily. It's just a four a simple type bend and with the way the geometry is on the piece it's well executed and it bends together fairly quickly with just a pair of uh, flat pliers. Uh, you could also use the photo etch bender but uh, the, the plier was more than suffice for this. Not a needle nose one. I have these special like uh, craft pliers where it's like it's broad and flat like a rectangle. I'll probably throw a picture of it on the screen if I can find one on Google but regardless that's what I use for bending the PE on this model here and it worked very very well. If the piece are not bent properly, then, you know, you'll, you can have some problems and the piece will not be straight. And, but if you're careful and you know how to bend PE, yeah, it, it, it'll work out quite well for you. So one thing that I forgot to mention earlier on in the video, and it's something that's really important to keep in mind, specifically if you're building your vehicle for either Bundeswehr, U.S. military, or any other type of military outside of Taiwan, is with these numbers that are molded into the upper portions of the hull. On this kit here, it actually has these numbers rendered right here on the front plate. There's another one right here below the spare tire, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's another one right here under this one as well. And although these numbers are actually really, really nicely done, they're crisp, and they give a lot of extra detailing here to the front of the, and to the sides of the vehicle, and these numbers are present on the real examples, However, for this particular example here, it does have a very interesting quirk. You see, the vehicle that AFV Club was utilizing as reference material to design this kit here was a vehicle that was being used or was used by the Taiwanese military, specifically the ROC, the Republic of China. Why this is relevant is because on the tooling itself, above the cast number, you will have the abbreviations of ROC, and it's found on all three of those locations. Well, if the vehicle is not being depicted as an ROC vehicle, it's not going to have those letters. So this is something that needs to be paid attention to by the builder, and I guarantee you almost everyone out there who's built one of these kits who did not render it for a Republic of China vehicle has this little error in it. So it's one of those things that you do want to pay attention to. Also, if you're a judge at a model contest, yeah, you, someone shows up one of these. Ooh, look at that. It says ROC on it. So the ROC, as nice as it was rendered on, needed to have been deleted. And this was taken care of very easily with a very sharp 
X-Acto blade. This was simply just used to cut these little letters off, and then with a little bit of sandpaper, if that was all that was required to just polish it down to the format that we see right here. With those letters removed, although you are admittedly removing some nice detailing on the model, but it's making it more accurate for a vehicle that's in this case being depicted for the U.S. military as opposed to a vehicle being from the Republic of China. If you are working on an ROC vehicle though, rock on, just keep it as is and just continue from there. And that's all there is to the detailing. This takes us down to the paint and the markings. For the paintwork, I went with a three-tone NATO camouflage pattern, much along the lines as the way we saw it on the box art. I always did like the M88, and I really do like it with the three-tone NATO camouflage scheme. I've seen several real ones in this type of format, both on pictures on the internet, and even I've seen pictures that my friend sent me one time when uh, she was at, at a Army Reserve station somewhere in, in the state. And... It's just something cool about these old military vehicles that are in the, you know, in a three-tone scheme. It, it's just, it, it always looks appealing to me. Something like an original M1 Abrams or the original Bradley or uh, an M109, you know, with the, you know, the old format. It just, they look cool in this three-tone scheme. And this one here, I really wanted to make it look like the ones I saw in those photographs as much as possible. Uh, I'm pretty sure times haven't changed. And as recently as 2011 or so, I've seen vehicles like this or even M88s in this type of condition it's just sitting again in some army reservist parking lot somewhere so uh, i'm pretty confident there's still quite a few of these floating around as for the paintwork itself i went with utilizing the tamiya tricolors and the tamiya nato camouflage colors are probably the best out there on the market they've been around for a while now and the tamiya colors are perfect. NATO green, NATO black, and NATO brown. Admittedly though, the NATO green on this one is not Tamiya per se. It's actually my own exterior latex that was made by, well, enlarging a bottle of Tamiya NATO green to a gallon format, and I use it on my NATO vehicles. But regardless, the tint is still the same. For the weathering, I went with washes, filters, and counter shading. All of those mentioned effects were done via the airbrush, much along the lines as I touched upon on my other videos. And then for some other effects, I went with Tamiya Panel Line Accent, which on a build like this really, really comes in handy because there's just so many nooks and crannies. It just goes into those sections and it highlights them very, very well. Uh, aside from that, the remainder of the weather was done with the dry brush technique that I've touched upon, you know, again, on my other videos in the past. All those were used to get the model up to the condition that we have here. Other things to mention about the paintwork that I neglected to mention before, well, all of the periscopes are painted in gloss black. Some people out there, I frequently get questions about this on what color to paint periscopes. Some people like silver, which is the worst color to use for a periscope. I've never seen a silver paint or a silver looking periscope in my life and I've seen these things in person many times. Uh, the, some other people also like blue. Blue is okay i guess but in my opinion i always like to go with gloss black from all the real examples that i've seen and i've you know crawled around once the, the vehicle's buttoned up you, they tend to just be this black color they tend to see have a bluish tint to them is when you see the reflection of the sky reflecting on the lenses that's when they'll have a bluish tint but most of the time when i've seen them they're usually just black in color like the one that you see here this is true for all of the periscopes on the front the two here on the very front plate. And also this vehicle has some periscopes hidden back here on the rear section that we saw before when I was talking about the oxyacetylene tank. Other things to mention are the lights. We have this red light, light right over here. In addition to the red light, we have the main headlights again, and they are painted in the following format. And they are basically found on other vehicles with the same type of pattern, such as the M60, M4882, and the M109 Sheridan. Basically, his headlight was used quite often, and you can see the format, where the one on the left-hand side is your standard white light, while the one adjacent to it is the blackout light, and is a, the exact same format on the opposite side. I already touched upon the cat's eye lenses earlier, so there's no point continuing about that. And this wall plugs us now into the markings. For the markings, I went with the Kit Supply Water Slide decals and they were excellent. They went out without any sort of problems. And once on, they were lacquered in place with the varnish. Lacquer is really a poor choice of words, but I'll just continue to roll with it. For the varnish, I went with the VMS matte varnish as I've 
touched upon on many, many videos, and the reason why I touch upon them in many videos is I absolutely love the product. Once the varnish was applied, it left the model in the resulting look that you see here. And again, I absolutely adore this product and I'm gonna be utilizing it until, you know, the end of time, <laughs> more or less. Uh, the last thing I do wanna mention is the, the exhaust hood here is done after the varnish was added. And this is done at the very tail end of the build, the varnish gets added, then I go ahead and add the soot here with the airbrush. The reason why this is done after the varnish is because once the decals get applied, they are fragile, specifically for high air or high PSI being blown on them. Uh, if you're airbrushing and <laughs> the pieces aren't varnished or sealed whatsoever, it's more common for these things to f crack and fling off on you due to the PSI. And if that happens, uh, you're gonna be in a, a bit of trouble. So once the varnish gets added, they are more resilient to that type of a problem, but it's not foolproof. So you have to dial in your PSI correctly. And if you do that and you are cautious enough, you should be able to airbrush the soot effects like I've done here. And the model just turn out great for you as opposed to having some breakage happening. If it does happen on you, there are ways to fix it, but that's out of the scope of this video. And at the end of the day, I couldn't be any happier in how this build turned out. As I mentioned before, this build was a bit of a boxy match in order to get it up to the condition that we have here. However, that wasn't necessarily the fault with the kit. It was just more or less me just having a string of bad luck incidents. So you can't really hold that to the model per se. Uh, as for the build here, I am really happy to finally have one of these models built and added to the collection where it's definitely going to fill in very, very nicely. As I touched upon earlier, this was always one of those kits that I would constantly see around, always lusted after it, so finally acquiring it, building it up to the condition that we have here, and adding it to the collection is definitely something that once it's crossed off the to-do list, it feels, oh, that much more better. And if anything, after wrapping this one up here, I'm really getting the urge to revisit the other AFV Club M88 I have in my collection, and possibly maybe add one or two more just to round off the various different versions of this kit that they do produce, but those are all more or less topics for another video for another time. Which I think is a perfect time to segue us into skill level and recommendation. And first and foremost, if you are a beginner or someone who's completely new to plastic models, this kit here is absolutely 100% not going to be for you. Don't even entertain the idea, don't even humor it, forget it, nope, absolutely not, do not pass go, do not collect $200, not going to happen, just no, just no, 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 no. Not gonna happen. It's just, trust me, no, okay, uh, straight up. Even some beginner builders, ah, I would hazard against this kit over here. This kit is more or less intended to be built by someone who has all of their skill sets ironed out. All the basic skill sets with working with plastic models, if you are good with working with photo etch, and also if you're good with working with fine, fiddly detail bits. And if you're a intermediate builder, you may not necessarily have those skill sets fully ironed out at that time. Granted, you have a hell of a better chance compared to someone who's a straight up beginner, but you may hit a point on this build where you may be in a little bit over your head. This build over here, I more or less recommend to someone who's an advanced model builder. As an advanced builder, you should have all these prerequisite skill sets fully ironed out at this time. Now, granted, this kit here is not nearly as complicated as some other more contemporary super kits that have been released over the recent years. However, this one here can still throw you a curveball or two due to the way the kit is designed and also with the frailness and fragility found on several of the sub-assembly components. You really have to keep on the ball when working on some of these components or else you could run into things where parts are just getting damaged or broken from simple sprue extraction to like for instance on that A-frame over there, those really tiny telephone pole style handlebars which just, they look like they just want to crack off just by looking at them and the fact that I didn't break any throughout the construction of this project, specifically with the luck I had on this one, is nothing short of a miracle. So I definitely consider that a win, all things considered. Regardless, this kit over here is definitely one, again, that's intended more or less for someone who's an advanced range builder. And as I touched upon earlier in the video, this kit here is still just as relevant today in the year 2023 when I'm filming this as it was in the early 1990s when the kit was first developed. 
because this is again the only option out there for a 135th scale M88 pattern of vehicle. Fortunately, the kit is excellent. It does the job perfectly fine and the tooling on it really did age like wine. This model here, it's just an awesome model kit. Whoever did the engineering on this really paid attention and they were able to come up with a kit with the tooling of that era that more or less really stood the test of time. Clearly on this build here, I more or less stayed with the confines of the kit. However, a lot of experienced model builders out there, they like to deviate from the kit and add other amenities to the model to further enhance it from the way you see it here. And fortunately, if you're one of those type of builders, again, this is totally optional, but if you deem fit, there are lots of aftermarket accessories out there for this particular series of kits. Uh, well, obviously in this video, I touched upon the the 3D printing components I've developed for this model here. But outside of those, you have things like a set of workable track links. You have other components out there in resin, in photo etch, and I believe there are also some other components out there in 3D print as well in order to add to this model, bring it up to a more elevated level compared to the out-of-the-box uh, offering here. Again, in my opinion, it's more or less optional, and this is best left up to the discretion of the builder. Clearly for my build, I just basically went with the kit components and with the exception of the parts that I mentioned and the reasons why I mentioned the out of the box components will build into an excellent example of the M88 regardless. And I think we've basically fully covered that aspect so let's pivot us into recommendations. Clearly if anyone is a fan of modern era military vehicles the M88 here is definitely one that's going to be recommended for you. The M88 besides widely being utilized by the US military for a really long duration of time was equally as widely distributed to other NATO countries who utilize them also to a great extent and probably even still today. Which as I mentioned before in the unboxing portion the kit does supply you with the decals in order to build the model in one of those type of configurations. Outside of that if anyone is just a fan of armored recovery vehicles well needless to say the M88 in my opinion is definitely the king of ARVs with possibly the Leopard version of the ARV being a close second. But me being an American Tank fan, I'm kind of biased in that opinion. Regardless, you know, the record of this vehicle speaks for itself, and the M88 is definitely one of the best ARVs that have ever been devised. And if you're a fan of just collecting and building those type of vehicles, the M88 here is just definitely a no-brainer for you. One other individual who I cannot recommend this kit enough would be anybody who's into building dioramas. I mean, this model here oozes, I mean, just oozes diorama potential. Probably more than any other model that I've brought up to the table and done a review on up to this point. I mean, just with the sheer amount of configurations that you can build this model in, where you can have the boom, the spade, either up or down or vice versa, you can have the winch extended or retracted, even the hatches are fully functional. Because of all of these different options, this really lends itself to excellent diorama potential. You can have a scene where it's pulling something, it's flipping something over, you're tearing down Saddam Hussein, basically anything you could imagine. And because this vehicle was used for such a long period of time, you can render it either in the 1970s with a Merc camouflage scheme, where it's just, or you could have it as just olive drab, or you can have it as desert, three tornado, you name it, there's so many potential options this, that's awarded to the builder if they are interested in going with some kind of a diorama setting. It's just, I just cannot recommend this kid enough for that type of an individual. Another person who I'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who's an avid fan of the Patton family. The M88 really is nothing more than a cousin of the M47 or even the M48 Patton. And if you are a type of person like, like yours truly and you really like the Patton platform, you have the M46, the 47, the 48, the 60, 681, Starship, all of those, the M88 will just fit right into that collection without batting an eye. In fact, I'd argue it's more or less a must-have in my opinion. The next person who I'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who's, well, getting a little bored with building several of the other standard options that are out there. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you built four or five different versions of the Panther, the Tiger, Shermans, and, you know, so on and so forth, 
yeah, those builds are fun, but after a while, you know, maybe you, you want to do something a little bit different, a little bit unique, something that'll really stretch your legs a little bit in terms of just the build itself, as well as also a subject matter that, you know, has a bit of flavor to it. Well, the M88 here is definitely something I would recommend for, for you with the caveat that you have the certain skill sets in mind, but chances are if you've done like eight or seven tigers and panthers, uh, I think by that point you should basically have your ducks in a row, so to speak. But again, yeah, this vehicle here, it's a very interesting vehicle. The subject matter is very unique, and it's just lends itself for a very unique building experience. It's definitely one that you have to take your time with, so if you're looking for a build that you can put the hours in and not just burn and rush through it like you could with some other kits that are out there, the AFE Club M88 here, it's definitely something I would recommend checking out. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale US M88A1 Armored Recovery Vehicle. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posts of content, being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here, or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop with new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been posted on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by the ECA Shapeway store in order to find the HD 3D printed components I've used for this model over here, as well as the other smaller scale detail components that I've designed up and released in the past. And Finally, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, and I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then, take care.